to today's episode of the Search Podcast. Uh, my name is Saud Al Zaid, and today I will be giving another uh, talk based on a session that I gave for the Search Kuwait uh, live sessions. Uh, Search Kuwait is a um, initiative that was started by the uh, Kuwaiti Association of Surgeons. Uh, and the American College of Surgeons Kuwait chapter. We do have a chapter here in Kuwait, and I'm very proud to say that uh, I'm affiliated with it. Um, it's a very resident-driven initiative. Uh, they do two sessions a week. I think that we're starting a live journal club soon, or they are. And you get a free certificate, free CME points, so there's nothing bad going on there. And the sessions are really good because they're really long and there's lots of interaction. There's like questions and polls and things like that. And although it's not directly related to this podcast, um, yes, this is called the Surge Podcast, and they're called Surge Kuwait, but I would like to think that we're somehow affiliated, if only geographically, for about six months out of the year. Um, so uh, today's talk is about blunt cerebrovascular injuries, and it's a continuation of uh, last talk, uh, where we were talking about a 72-year-old gentleman. Uh, that had had a crush injury to the neck with a combined vertebral artery uh, injury, a, a C3 vertebral fracture, and a massive hematoma of the neck whereby you couldn't get a crike or a trach in. And so therefore I had to go uh, through uh, the thyrohyoid membrane and split the floor of the omohyoid to get there. Um, you know, we'd reported it in uh, one of our posters. We never got the case report done because... It was just too, too much going on with corona and stuff like that. But the patient did leave the hospital. The one concern I had was that he had developed a frontal lobe infarction. Secondary to the only thing that I can think of is a vertebral artery dissection. And this was confirmed on a CT angio. And so uh, today's talk is about what happens when you miss a blunt cerebrovascular injury and how you can prevent it. So um, another more famous case um, is that of a 13-year-old girl who was at a hockey game in 2002. Uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets versus the Calgary Flames. The puck hit her left temple. She walked to the first aid station. She was GCS of 15. Uh, she'd had a witness seizure there. She'd recovered, ambulated. Her CT brain was considered normal. 24 hours later, uh, she, sorry, 48 hours later, she had fever, sudden loss of consciousness, CT revealed brain edema, and she had died that same day. And Perry Morton, they found out that she had a blunt cerebrovascular injury. And the reason why you screen for this is because, I, by the way, everybody should read the Biffle paper that's quoted here. Uh, it's a good paper that tells you how you can prove a point uh, in medicine and not get yourself into trouble. <laughs> it's a very well-written paper. Uh, so the incidence that's estimated in the Biffle series is between 25 and 35%. Uh, the symptoms, you know, 70% of the time will occur when, when you screen them, but screen an asymptomatic 27%, right? And that's why it's 25 to, uh, 25 to 35%. And, you know, I would say that when you're screening with symptoms, you're already too late because there's a 23% mortality and 48 to 80% of the survivors have permanent neurological deficits. So waiting for symptoms to occur before you do the CT angio or the angiography or the duplex, just not right. Um, you know, the majority of injuries will manifest between the first 10 and 72 hours of post-trauma, uh, but that's not to say that uh, somebody uh, shouldn't be screened. In our particular case, well, we got extremely lucky because we had free access to MRI. We picked up on it early, and the patient left the hospital with no neurological deficits, despite suffering a minor infarction. The other reason why is because, you know, forget the mortality risk, forget everything else. If you identify them asymptomatic, they remain asymptomatic, and that's very important. When you look at the traditional risk factors quoted across the literature, and this is an excerpt from the uh, original Biffle paper, uh, anything that has a high-speed mechanism or evidence of a high-speed mechanism manifest in injury burden tends to be associated with cerebrovascular injuries. However, the main sort of warning signs are severe uh, cervical extension, rotation, hyperextension, displaced mid-face or complex mandibular fracture, 
closed head injury consistent with diffuse axonal injury, near hanging or hanging, a seat belt abrasion across the neck, and I'd contend that the neck hematoma was that, fractured in proximity to the external car internal carotid or vertebral arteries, base of skull fractures or vertebral body fractures. That was the original uh, Biffle criteria. The modified Biffle criteria, the Denver modification of the Biffle criteria, uh, include the uh, presence of arterial hemorrhage, a cervical brewery, expanding cervical hematoma, focal neurological deficit, unexplained neurological findings, ischemic stroke, Lafort 2 or 3, cervical spine fracture, base of skull fracture, first three cervical spine vertebra, and diffuse axonal injury with a GCS below 6, or evidence of hanging or near hanging, or an anoxic brain injury in the context of a mechanistic trauma. Now that's a lot to remember, but effectively what you're looking at here is any hard signs of neck trauma, plus any base of skull fractures, any unexplained drops in GCS, Evidence of high-speed mechanisms of injury, including complex Lefort fractures, or base of skull fractures, or diffuse axonal injury. That's basically what you're looking at. Those are the three main components. There is a grading system for it, but unlike when we're dealing with a spleen or a liver, the grading system here uh, involves us trying to figure out which patients might benefit from surgery early and which patients might benefit from antithrombotic therapy, and which patients might progress despite everything. In general, grade 1 is 25% narrowing or less. Grade 2 is greater than 25% narrowing. Grade 3 is a pseudoaneurysm that has formed. Uh, grade 4 is an occlusion, and grade 5 is free extravasation with a, basically an internal decapitation. Most of the grade 1s remain grade 1s. They have a relatively low risk of stroke, 3%. And in most cases, we tend to advocate for antithrombotic therapy, especially the newer guidelines that should be out this month. Grade 2s, however, 70% uh, will progress to grade 3s. In fact, there is some thought that grade 2s aren't really a dissection in the sense that a standardized vertebral artery dissection might be. They might be smaller pseudoaneurysms that are just being picked up. 11% will have strokes if not treated with antithrombotic therapy. Grade threes, 33% will have strokes, and so therefore should be treated semi-urgently. Grade fours and fives require surgery. Whenever you treat them, now there used to be a debate on whether to use heparin or aspirin. The newer guidelines, although they're not level one bits of evidence, seem to, to emphasize antithrombotic therapy no matter what it is. The one that's been most studied is the heparin, but the one that's being most used by most practice groups especially in the realm of vascular and endovascular surgery, seems to be combination of aspirin and Plavix. Now, we've had recent changes to the guidelines. Uh, this happened literally a week ago. Uh, the changes to the guidelines include a standard screening process being recommended in every hospital. So we use the Denver modification. In other institutions, they do something else. But it has to be written on a paper with a couple of signatures from the higher-ups to make it clear and kosher. Number two, stenting is out. So there was a debate on carotid stenting, etc. That's by the wayside now. We don't stent them. The outcomes just aren't there. CT angio is sort of recommended, like they're saying that it's okay to do. But I think that when you read the wording, what they're really trying to say is do the CT angio because the risk benefit is optimized there. Whereas with angiography, there's certain risks and it's more invasive. There is no real level one evidence. And anything that's above a grade four should be surgically corrected urgently. My question to you as a group here is, when should we follow these things up? So I've made it a rule that we must repeat imaging in a week to 10 days for everybody. Uh, and I follow them up in six months in clinic afterwards. But what do you guys do? Because I haven't seen a consensus yet. And I think that the data might be mildly lacking there. Let me know your thoughts. Thank you for listening and please subscribe.